Which is better financially, buying or renting? Buying a home in 2023 may seem like a poor idea given increased housing prices and soaring interest rates, which make buying more expensive than ever. But renting also seems like a suboptimal solution, given that rents are rising fast and renting at higher and higher prices may seem like throwing money away. Given these two less than ideal choices, what should you do, especially in a high cost of living area? Let's jump into all of the factors you should consider when deciding between buying versus renting in 2023. To demonstrate these factors in a realistic way, I am going to add in example numbers from my city, Austin, showing a real scenario analysis of buying versus renting. Let's start with the hard numbers, the financial factors. When renting, the financial costs are pretty straightforward. You will have rent, any associated fees like pet fees, and renter's insurance. That's it. In our Austin example, we will use $1,820 a month, the average monthly rent for a one-bedroom apartment in the city. This gives us a base rent of $1,820 a month, plus $14 a month for renter's insurance, totaling $1,834 a month to rent. This number is a good figure for year one, but we do need to factor inflation, which is a small but noticeable amount. Assuming inflation returns to normal levels soon, we will estimate that base rent increases by around 2% per year over the long term. When buying, the financials are a bit more complicated. For starters, you need a down payment to buy a house. Traditionally, 20% is the gold standard when buying a house, but in high cost of living areas, first time buyers can often only afford to put less than 20% on a down payment, given how high housing prices are. Paying less than 20% down means your mortgage lender will require you to pay private mortgage insurance, or PMI, until 20% of the house's equity is paid off. We'll factor that in later. For this example, with a median house price of $528,000 in Austin, let's assume a 15% down payment at $79,020. Additionally, for a realistic number, we need to factor in closing costs. Closing costs cover a variety of expenses relating to buying the house, such as realtors' fees, bank fees, and inspections. While closing costs can vary, let's estimate conservatively another 6% of the sale price in upfront closing costs, adding $31,680. This brings our total upfront cost of a house to $110,700 before we've even paid a single monthly payment. That's expensive. To calculate the monthly payment, we will need to factor in the payment and interest rate, PMI since our down payment was below 20%, and other expenses such as homeowner's insurance and property taxes. For our base payment, Using a standard 6.4% interest rate on the loan, we arrive at $2,810. Property taxes, being a bit higher in Texas, come out to $548 a month. Homeowner's insurance is estimated at another $154 a month and PMI at $93 a month. This totals $3,610 a month to pay for the house. Maintenance costs are often overlooked by first-time buyers and should really be budgeted in as well. A good rule of thumb is to assume 1% of the property's value in maintenance and repair costs each year. This adds another around $440 a month in expected repair costs, bringing the total budgeted monthly cost up to $4,050 a month. The difference in these two monthly costs is huge. Owning the median house is more than double the cost of renting the median apartment in this high cost of living area, and this trend carries across most of the highest cost of living metros in the U.S. When renting, your monthly cost is simply lower. 
you spend less of your money on housing compared to buying a home. However, you are giving up the chance to build equity. Even if the monthly costs of buying are much higher than renting, you are slowly building up equity in an asset that you aren't doing while renting. This asset will appreciate over time as well, resulting in a relatively stable asset to build wealth in. Traditionally, 3% per year growth rate is used to determine housing market appreciation. But, in high cost of living areas, this figure is often even higher. So, buying is still the better option, even though it's much more expensive, right? Not necessarily. A disciplined person can actually leverage renting and investing to come out ahead of a home buyer. If you invested the difference between rent and what you would have paid to buy, in our example, $2,216 a month, into an investment that returns a higher yearly appreciation, you would come out ahead in the long run. Investing an extra $2,216 a month into the S&P 500 and just holding would return you an average growth of over 10% per year, much higher than the average 3% of home appreciation. The exact numbers in our example are as follows. The home buyer would, in 30 years, have a fully paid off house. Assuming average housing market growth of 3%, the homeowner would have a fully paid for house worth $1.28 million, more than double the initial purchase price of $528,000 due to appreciation. The renter, never purchasing any housing, but investing the difference into the stock market each month, returning an average 10.7% per year, would have an investment portfolio worth over $5 million. In our modern era of record house prices, high interest rates, and inflation, the average person in a high cost of living area is finding it harder than ever to buy a house. But buying a house may not be the optimal financial path anymore. What's important is that you save and invest as much as you can. So, buy a house in a high cost of living area if it makes sense financially. But, if it doesn't make sense, renting and investing the difference into the stock market may just put you ahead of your friend who can somehow afford that $4,000 a month mortgage. Thanks for watching.